Um, and that would be your general view on the Geneva Accord. Um, there's been a lot of criticism about whether the West was too weak and has now put itself in a, an impossible situation, really, where we have accepted uh, this Russian new doctrine as a fact and that it will be very difficult to turn back from that. Is that your view as well? Yes, I, I mean, I think that Senator Kerry, and again, I'm so sorry Ambassador's not here, I think <laughs> Senator Kerry behaved, made one of the biggest diplomatic blunders... Good. <laughs> um, biggest diplomatic blunders in recent American history when he accepted that Russia has legitimate interest in Ukraine. Yeah, I don't believe... We, we've always steered clear of any talk of legitimate interests. You, know, fr you have all sorts of interest as a neighbouring country, um, but this idea that history gives you rights... Um, is complete nonsense. History gives you responsibilities. And boy, does Russia have historical res responsibilities in Ukraine. Mm. You know, we could, have a whole s we could have a whole hour and we wouldn't have covered all the historical responsibilities that Russia has in Ukraine. So I think it's profoundly misconceived to think that, you know, to, the, 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 I mean, to have the Ukrainians in the room is good, but I think that we should be, um, our diplomacy should be backing up the Ukrainians. And we should be saying there is a huge difference you know, you claim that this is a hunter in, um, in Ukraine. Well, this is the first hunter in history which is desperately trying to have an election as soon as possible. <laughs> now, to, to me, that stretches the de definition of hunter to breaking point. <laughs> and not only that, it's an election which, unlike a Russian election, where you don't know who's going to win. So it's like a real election with a capital E rather than a selection, which is what you get in Russia. So I, 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 was, I was deeply unhappy about that, and I think that it, it lacked conditionality. There was no what happens if they don't, which I think is an essential part of those deals. So I think our, I think our, our di diplomacy was, was, was on the wrong foot and was far too accommodating to Russia. The, our diplomacy should be about coordinating sanctions on Russia, making them effective, and front-loading them. So doing lots and lots of things now, and then saying, when you stop doing this, we may take a few of these off. Whereas what we're actually doing is saying, um, we're going to tread very gently on this toe, and if you don't step, if, if you don't uh, stop, we may tread gently on your next toe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Vladimir. Please, if you would like to comment on on Edward's speech, um, I should say that you have extensive experience in Russian politics, both from being a candidate um, as well as now being uh, a senior advisor at the Institute of Modern Russia. So you're a scholar as well. So please, if you would stand and comment. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Karen. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, I would like, first of all, to thank the organizers of the, of the Free World Forum here in Stockholm. I, and I haven't realized it's only the second time you're holding this. I've heard so much about the forum. It looks like it's been around for many years. So um, it's a very good opportunity to discuss these issues. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. And uh, it's always great to listen to Ed. And uh, I know when Ed says the modest we uh, about the West being wrong in its predictions and being too modest, um, uh, and being too uh, kind of timid in, in what it thinks is going to happen. Um, Ed Lucas is not one of, of those who have been. So uh, it's always good to uh, listen to him. And uh, um, maybe it's unfortunate that so many things that he's been saying come true, but still a um, very important voice on all these issues. And, and one more point on what um, Ed said. When, um, when he talks about the similarities uh, with um, Hitler's foreign policy and his um, aggressive behavior in Europe in the 1930s, uh, it has to be mentioned that this similarity and this analogy is actually embraced um, by, the, uh, by the Kremlin people. Two weeks ago, there was an article in Izvestia, one of the main pro-Kremlin newspapers, uh, by um, a guy called Andranik Migranian. He styles himself as a political analyst. In fact, he's, uh, he's one of the Kremlin's uh, uh, you know, spokespeople, de facto, um, who actually drew a distinction. This is the first time I've ever heard you know, anybody say this uh, in modern times, that there's actually a distinction, he, he argued, between Hitler before 1939 and Hitler after 1939. And according to him, uh, apparently Hitler before 1939 was not such a bad guy. And he was actually a gatherer of German lands. He was a German patriot. And it was, you know, it was a, astonishing to read this. I mean, I guess he, he didn't know that the, you know, the Kristallnacht and the concentration camps predated 1939. Or maybe he did, and that makes it even, even scarier. But that, that analogy is certainly by no means you know, far-fetched. Uh, and uh, sensationalist. It's actually embraced by the Kremlin people themselves. Uh, but I want to uh, talk a little bit about the domestic angle from all this, because I think that's the aspect that, that is not discussed as much as perhaps it should be uh, in, uh, in international circles. Um, I flew here to Stockholm directly from, uh, from Kiev, from Ukraine, where three days ago uh, there was a forum 
held at the initiative of uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, for more than a decade Russia's most prominent political prisoner, um, who now heads the uh, Open Russia Foundation. And uh, this forum, which was entitled Ukraine-Russia Dialogue, brought uh, together hundreds uh, of representatives of um, civil societies of both countries, of the cultural and intellectual elites of both countries, of independent journalists, of pro-democracy political leaders from, from Russia and from Ukraine, including on the Ukrainian side, for instance, uh, Petro Poroshenko, who is the leading presidential contender, Mustafa Jemilov, the leader of the Crimean Tatars, who was, I believe, yesterday nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for this year. Uh, from the Russian side, um, if we're talking about the political leadership, it included such people as Boris Nemtsov, the, one of the Russian opposition leaders, uh, and Ilya Ponomaryov, the only member of the Russian parliament who had the courage to vote against uh, the annexation of Crimea, and many, many others. And I think the, the strong message of the forum uh, was you know, that while Mr. Putin is engaging uh, in spreading unrest and encouraging and staging armed provocations in the east and south of Ukraine, uh, Russian civil society has expressed publicly its solidarity and its support for the people of Ukraine and to show that there is indeed, as uh, Mikhail Kharkovsky again said in his speech on the Maidan uh, in March, that there is a very different Russia, not the Russia of Putin and the Kremlin and of the crony and corrupt regime that we've had in our country for the last 15 years, uh, but the Russia of its citizens and the Russia of civil society. I think that that Russia is not talked about enough uh, in world media. And it must be said that uh, this is both the work uh, of the Kremlin's propaganda machine, uh, which you know, pretends that Putin's regime is Russia, that that's the same thing, and that it represents the whole of the country. And unfortunately, many people as well, I have to say, in the Western media, who also kind of buy this line and use the shorthand, uh, you know, Russia, I, I know Ed, Ed's not one of them. He, you know, clearly means the Kremlin when, when he talks about these things. But too many people in Western media talk about, you know, Russia, when what they actually mean are actions by an unelected authoritarian regime that represses the rights and freedoms of Russian citizens just as much as it now represses the freedom and independence and territorial integrity uh, of Ukraine. And I think that's a very important distinction uh, to make. The crisis in Ukraine, or I should say Putin's aggression against Ukraine, from my point of view, um, has largely domestic motivations. Uh, Putin's insistence for so long uh, you know, about keeping in power, at all costs almost, his client regime, his client puppet regime of Viktor Yanukovych uh, in Kiev, and now Putin's panic at the prospect of a successful democratic pro-European Ukraine is not, from my point of view, primarily about you know, geopolitical considerations and about re-establishing the Soviet era sphere of influence in, in Central and Eastern Europe. It's primarily motivated domestically. Putin's fear of a successful democratic and pro-European Ukraine is that it will serve as a, quote, dangerous precedent and a bad example, quote, unquote, for Russian society. What, he, what he's most afraid of is, a, is the prospect of a Maidan in Moscow. And that is why he has to, or he, rather he cannot allow himself uh, and allow his regime to allow the Ukrainian pro-democracy movement to succeed, because that will be contagious and he knows it will be. Let us not forget that since the end of 2011, we have seen tens of thousands of Russians come out to the streets of Moscow, St. Petersburg, other large cities across our country to protest against election fraud and the corruption uh, and the repression and the hypocrisy of the Putin regime. Let's not forget that even according to the official figures released by the, um, the Electoral Commission from the so-called presidential election uh, in 2012, Mr. Putin has lost majority support in Moscow, in Kaliningrad, in Vladivostok, in Omsk, in Vladimir, and in other large cities and towns across the country. These are official figures. We can only guess what the real numbers were. Let's not forget that just a few months ago, in September of 2013, in the round of uh, regional elections uh, uh, across Russia, the opposition scored important victories in many regions, including Yaroslav, Ekaterinburg, and Petrozavodsk and Karelia, not, not so far from here. Um, and of course, Alexei Navalny, whom had mentioned, the, uh, the opposition leader in Russia. Even according to the official results, uh, received 30% uh, of the vote in the election for mayor of Moscow. Uh, you know, and these victories finally laid to rest Putin's propaganda myth that the opposition in Russia is a marginal group with no public support. 
They remember all of this, and they're afraid of it. And that's why I think what happened in, in, with the annexation of Crimea and what's now happening in Donetsk and in other places in East and South Ukraine, that's, they, this is all primarily uh, motivated by uh, domestic reasons. What Putin has done, has, has been done by, by these you know, regimes and real hunters uh, so many times in history is, is try to divert attention from domestic problems and domestic issues uh, to, uh, you know, to this pseudo-patriot nationalist uh, war hype. Um, he's managed to uh, increase uh, his ratings by doing this, as so many authoritarian regimes have done before. Just before the new year, uh, the opinion polls by the Levada Center, which is the, the main independent opinion pollster in Russia, showed that only 40-something, uh, 47% of likely voters uh, would back Putin if there was a presidential election held tomorrow. Today, it's just three months later, it's over 70%, a massive 30% boost. He's managed to split the opposition because some uh, people in the left-wing part of the Russian opposition have, have uh, backed the annexation of Crimea. So he's managed to do this. Um, in terms of uh, you know, domestic policies, the aggression against Ukraine uh, is being closely followed by aggression and crackdown, further crackdown if that's possible, against Russian public opinion and Russian civil society. In the last month, we have seen China-style uh, blockages of leading independent news websites in Russia, including the Daily Journal, uh, Granny.ru, uh, and others, including uh, Alexei Navalny's uh, website and blog, one of the most popular opposition resources in Russia that details uh, the regime's corruption and has been doing it for many years. They have passed new laws. Uh, you know, wh while the Kremlin is hypocritically calling for, quote, federalization in Ukraine, uh, which is its code word you know, for establishing its control of the eastern regions. A new law has just been passed in the Duma that completely abolishes mayoral elections in all the large cities and towns across Russia. They've had enough of the humiliating defeats, uh, I suppose, in the past few months. And also another law um, which, which uh, uh, proposed amendment to the election code, which effectively ends ballot access for genuine opposition parties to both national, regional, uh, and also municipal elections by leaving it at the discretion of the regime which parties can participate and which cannot, uh, because they introduced this filter in terms of the uh, requirement to collect signatures, which basically serves as a, as a block for any independent actor who wants to um, participate in the, uh, in the electoral process. And of course, we still have dozens of uh, political prisoners in our country, and many opposition leaders are being persecuted and prosecuted, including Navalny, who's been under house arrest and banned by court order from uh, uh, in any way communicating with the outside world. And of course, he's facing three or four more criminal cases that would land him in, in, in prison uh, at any moment, essentially, again, at the discretion of the Kremlin. So let's, um, let's remember all these facts and all this direct correlation between inward repression and outward aggression uh, that has happened so many times in history, especially in, in, in Russian history before. But I think the irony is, uh, the irony of this whole situation is that while Putin's biggest fear uh, is fear of a Maidan in Moscow, um, all he's doing now is making it more likely in the medium-term perspective because by shutting down all the other avenues of expressing um, protests, uh, you know, by hyping up this nationalist war, pseudo-patriotic hysteria, we know from Russian history that such um, hysterias don't last long and they can provide the regime with a temporary boost but it's going to be short-term and when it ends, the regime finds itself in the worst situation then it started off. Suffice to remember, you know, 1904, 1905, and again, 1914 to 1917. Because the underlying domestic conditions are not changed by the hysteria over Ukraine and over Crimea. The Russian economy is still stagnating. In fact, now it's going to be worse because of the prospect of war and because of the sanctions that uh, Ed has mentioned. While the abuses of the rights and freedoms of Russian citizens that brought the Russian middle class to protest against Putin in the streets in 2011, 2012, have only got worse and are getting worse as we speak. So I think change in Russia, political change in Russia, is going to come much quicker than the current polls and the current propaganda messages from Putin's Kremlin uh, suggest. And here again, we, we go back to the you know, wrong predictions and wrong analysis that so many people make. I think the predictions you know, that Putin's regime is stable and that it's going to stay in power for many more years, I think they're from that category of predictions that will eventually turn out wrong. And of course, it's only up to the people of Russia to effect changes in our country. This cannot be done 
by any outside forces, and I'd argue it should not be done by any outside forces. But if the Western democratic world wants to show solidarity, both with the people of Ukraine, who are under external aggression as we speak, and with the people of Russia, who have been under this aggression from the authoritarian leadership in the Kremlin for the past 15 years, there are important steps that Western democracies can take. We speak all the time about the similarities between the current regime of Vladimir Putin and the Soviet um, the regime, the pre-1991 regime. And of course, there are many similarities, you know, from political prisoners to media censorship. There is, however, also one very important difference. Because while they were sending troops to other countries and uh, muzzling and jailing dissidents at home, members of the Soviet Politburo did not have bank accounts in the West did not send their kids to study in the West, did not buy luxury property in Western countries. The current Kremlin leaders and state oligarchs around them do. And I think it's very important to end this impunity and this double standard by introducing those visa bans and financial sanctions that the Magnitsky uh, Act in the US brought two years ago and that we've all been talking about for a long time. Again, refuting the message from Kremlin propaganda, these are not sanctions against Russia. These are sanctions against the people who abuse the rights of the people of Russia and who steal the money of the people of Russia. And as Ed mentioned, and I want to second that, there was an opinion poll uh, passed, uh, conducted in Russia in December 2012 after the US Magnitsky Act was adopted. And it showed a strong plurality of, the Ru of Russian citizens supporting these sanctions, despite the best efforts of the Kremlin's brainwashing and propaganda. Because these are pro-Russian sanctions, they are not anti-Russian sanctions. And for too long, uh, unfortunately, yeah, and, and the, of course the purpose of these sanctions is that you know, the only thing these people understand is personal consequences. If you talk to them about international agreements and international law and obligations, they'll laugh in your face. But they do understand personal consequences. That's the only thing they understand. And so the purpose of this is to make sure that these people think twice next time they, they want to send troops to another country or rig another election at home or beat up and arrest another protester or harass another journalist. For too long, I would argue, Western democracies have turned a blind eye to Putin's domestic repression until finally, as it inevitably does, it turned into outward aggression now and is bringing Europe to the brink of war. But of course, it's better late than never. And the uh, sanctions moves that we've seen from the US and the European Union in the last few weeks have been encouraging, especially the, the latest uh, American list of sanctions that includes uh, you know, really high profile people in Putin's uh, personal entourage like Kovalchuk, Timchenko, Rottenbergs and the others. And, and it's to be hoped that the European Union moves ahead with its own high profile list. And in fact, today there's a meeting of the uh, EU Council in Brussels that will decide on the expansion of the sanctions list. Uh, and I hope that the, it sends a strong message. So I think it really is time to act for the democratic world, to act with resolve and to act on principle. I think we're finally seeing this resolve and this principle, um, and I certainly hope uh, that this continues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it was interesting that you took up um, the Levada Center and, and the polls that they make there, because I saw an interview with Lev Gudkov, um, who, who did note that there has been a surge of popularity still. Uh, there are a lot of polls. It's difficult to know which one to believe, but, but nevertheless, there, there seems to be a a surge of popularity still uh, due to these rhetorics. But he said another thing that I, I would be interested to hear your comment on, and that is that uh, this has never happened before, that nationalism is very strong, most of all among the highly educated and the upper layers of society. Uh, is this true, you think, that there's been such a, a shift? And why is that, if it is true? Well, in terms of the polls, there certainly has been uh, a massive boost, as I mentioned, a 30% jump. Uh, in voting intentions from November to March, mm -hmm. unprecedented in, um, y you know, in the trend for Levada Center polls going back years. Also, the question that was asked just before the new year, you know, the question is, do you want Putin to remain president beyond the end of his current term? Before the new year, only 22% of Russians said yes, that they, they, they want Putin to continue, one in five. The poll that came out last week showed 32%, one in three. So also, uh, an impo st still far from a majority, I should add want Putin to remain president beyond 2018, but still also a big boost from, from that. Um, there certainly is uh, a rise in the, in the, in the nationalist feelings, in the pseudo-patriotic feelings. 
uh, we've see, we see it across the board in the questions. You know, that also Ed mentioned, you know, are you prepared to take these sanctions if they come in and uh, still not over 50%, but a lot of people say, say yes, we are, which, you know, basically denotes any lack of, of rationing, reasoning on that particular point. But I would, I would still say that this is, uh, first of all, this is artificial, because, of course, you know, when you have every single television channel directly and directly controlled by the government, you can only talk about public opinion in a limited sense. You know, it's not informed public opinion. Uh, and, and actually, it's surprising how, you know, in fact, how little support the regime gets on some of the points, given that the uh, uh, government controls every single message on national television. But I think it's, uh, it's true, but it's also temporary. It's artificial, and it's, it, it's superficial in a way, because, uh, you know, as I mentioned those examples, uh, from Russian history, authoritarian regimes in Russia don't have a good track record with small victorious wars. Uh, you know, a phrase coined by Mr. Pleve, the Tsarist interior minister in, back in 1904. And look how that worked out for them. So uh, it's certainly true, and I've seen these figures, and I've also uh, talked to Lev uh, Gutkov about this, who's a good friend, the, the director of the Levada Center. Uh, and these trends are certainly there, uh, but I think if we gather here at another Stockholm Free World Forum in, uh, in a year or two, again, as uh, you know, Ed gave this time frame about foreign policy predictions, I think if we talk about Russian public opinion a couple of years from now, it will be a very different picture. Thank you very much. Um, it'd be interesting to hear Gildon's view on this as well, since you've been you've been watching a lot of Russian television <laughs> lately. <laughs> it seems Gildon has been commenting a lot on this crisis, at least in Swedish national newspapers and in the media. And when I talked to you before this conference, you said that you should you should get a, a pay hike because of having to to stand for all this <laughs> propaganda that you've been listening to lately. So please. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very grateful to be here, and it's a privilege to to sit here. And uh, I'll try to give some comments on what's been said 